Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Planning Commission meeting of June 18th. Thank you all so much for coming out. I know it's a beautiful night and it's hard to come indoors. And were it not for us being taped, I'd say let's go outdoors. But we can't, so here we are. Um, what we're going to handle first before the Mouth Bay Initiative is um, Mr. Jouer's um, application for a preferred site. Um, this is a solar applet. Could I ask you to bring your mic a little closer? Sure. Oh, that's right. You have. That's right. I remember. I remember. Um, this um, application was uh, recessed two weeks ago to be brought up again for consideration tonight, and here we are. Um, Sarah, do you want to just briefly go through it and recap? Um, sure. This was uh, under your ranking from the uh, new town plan. Um, you developed a way of ranking preferred sites, and there's um, a point category where we can do it administratively or it's sent to the board or it's sent back to the applicant for improvement. And so this was one point shy of an administrative um, issuance of a preferred site. Um, so it's, I, I think as it was discussed in the last meeting, they haven't done a full visual analysis of it yet um, as they apply to the state um, for their approvals. And if it had, it probably would not be visible. Uh, it would probably have been found to be not visible at all from the neighbors and would have gained enough points to be done administratively. Um, so just, I, I think, a quick overview of where we're looking at. So you have... On. Roosevelt Highway, Creek Farm Road. This is Munson Flats. Um, this is um, Elm Hill Farm right here. And as you come down, there's a hill. And before it becomes floodplains in the back here, there's an open section of meadow that the, I think it's a 500 kilowatt uh, solar array is proposed. I don't know if you'd like to add anything, Mr. Joyer, or? And the neighbors were notified um, via mail prior to this meeting in case they had any input as of um, right before the meeting, staff had not heard from any of the neighbors. I do not know if any are present tonight with us. Well set. Take a motion to approve the... Um, well, yeah. are there any neighbors or anybody that... Is there any neighbors? Do you see any of your neighbors here? Do you see any of your neighbors? <laughs> <laughs> No neighbors. Uh, all right. Any other comments? Then can I take a motion to approve the application? I make a motion to approve the application. Do I hear a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. It's approved. You're all set. Mr. Joyer, you're you're good to go. You're all set. Thank you very much. You're more than welcome. Thank you for for your patience. Thank you. Uh, I'm from Oxford, the developer he's working with. So oh. you, are, are you guys just going to submit like a letter or something to us? Yep. Okay. So there's a letter for signature for our chair um, that will go to the Public Utility Commission right. um, after tonight's meeting. Cool. And we'll send you a copy as well. All right. All right. Thank you, guys. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank Happy you. Evening. Okay. Now for the feature film. Mouse Bay Initiative Land Conservation Option Work right. Session. Sarah. You can just go back to the, well, actually, you, let's see, what do you want to pull up? Um, why don't we pull up just the agenda for right now? Go back to the agenda. So we have a few different things that we can pull up here. Um, just uh, by way of introduction, I think I already introduced our intern, Mari Gillies. Um, from the UVM Rubenstein School joining us. He helped with the preparation of the staff notes tonight. Um, so staff notes and all this packet material, if you go to colchestervt.gov down the bottom right-hand side under agendas and minutes, the whole Planning Commission agenda here is online and it's all linked in. And so I'm going to be going over staff notes, which is usually on the bottom um, and just sort of giving you a quick walk through. Um, I, I think on the May 20th, and I apologize to the Planning Commission, your TV down below is out of operation tonight. We're sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, it's a little bit of a text heavy night. I don't have any great graphics or visuals. We can go to some of the spreadsheets um, if you want later, but 
just um, I, I think I'll sort of start back at the beginning. So May 20th, you had a forum, took, solicited a bunch of different ideas about what we could do for wastewater solutions. And one of the um, possible solutions that came up was land conservation. And there was some questions about what we had done for land conservation in the past. Was it a ballot item? Was there still existing authority um, to collect money? Uh, on the tax dollar for conservation. So I wanted to provide you with a little bit of background and information as to um, what we've done in terms of prior land conservation, where we're at sort of now. So we do not have an active land acquisition fund. Um, Marty helped with some of the research. We went back through some old town minutes um, and it appears that in fiscal year 88, 89, and then 89, 90, there was um, a ballot item on each year asking um, to have an assessment of one cent per $100 in real property assessment collected for those specific years um, towards land conservation for lakeshore properties along Route 127. Um, that money uh, was collected. It was um, held in a different account and we're not quite sure, but I believe it was most probably used in the purchase of Rossetti Natural Area. There are some we couldn't find minutes to substantiate that believed that um, there was discussion at one point about using it to purchase the old Captain Mallet, which is on the corner of Bay Road and East Lakeshore Drive on the lakeside. There was a restaurant there for many years that had a few different reiterations. Um, so the money was collected. It's no longer there. It's no longer authorized. Um, there was discussion in 1994 about reestablishing some sort of um, land conservation on the East Lakeshore Drive area. Um, the Village on Mallets Bay Committee in December 1984 in its minutes um, sort of had a, and you've transferred development rights. I'll use that because I think you're familiar with it. Um, but just a little bit about what that is, is there is a thought about incentivizing land conservation as opposed to outright purchase of it, of giving the people on the non-lake side additional development if they would pay to conserve the lake side. Um, the regulations weren't changed. That idea did not go any further. Um, and so that was sort of the last reiteration of looking uh, to actively try and conserve these Lakeshore Drive properties. Um, just a little bit about some of the other things that have been done in the community. I mentioned about the Rosetti Natural Area. We have had land conservation projects in the past that have um, um, used a variety of different partners. Um, the Lake Champlain Land Trust was involved with that. Um, the Colchester Land Trust, we do have a Colchester Land Trust that was active um, in past decades that helped with the conservation of properties. It's a separate organization from the town and not-for-profit that has seek, basically ceased action and lacks funds. Um, so there, it still is... Is that, um, just, is that accurate? thousand dollars and we're still active as a 501c3 um, I apologize the air conditioners have just turned on for the first time this summer so they're a little bit loud we can shut them off if people can't hear me but hopefully uh, that this lost the interference for that one um, so just a little bit more um, about what our recent land acquisition has looked like. Um, in 2004, we purchased the Bayside Hazlet property, which is if you come out Laker Lane, there's a leg of that right in front of it. It's really between East Lakeshore Drive and Blakely Road. Um, and that was purchased through a ballot item in 2004. So the way that we've tended to acquire property in more recent years is to ask for it on the ballot and have it funded by the tax dollar. Um, the one exception I sort of mentioned was the acquisition of the Village Park, which was in 2007 um, completed with recreation impact fees. So when new development is uh, permitted in the town of Colchester, there's a rec impact fee. Um, the fees were established on new development specifically to increase recreational opportunities for residents. And um, when that was expended, that was a big chunk of what we had built up in reserves for that. So. Um, 
we don't have a conservation fund or funding source at this time. There are specific items on ballots or specific purchase with um, rec impact fees, and we don't have some other towns. Uh, for instance, I believe Williston has a conservation fund. We do not have a conservation fund as the town. So it's a little bit about the history. Does anybody have questions about some of the past history or land acquisitions or? I can come back to this too. I just sort of rolling through here. Um, yeah. Um, just to, to, to clarify what I remember on the Rosetti Park, like Sarah said, that was Lake Champlain Land Trust. Um, I don't know if you remember how much that was. Probably was it like five hundred thousand or something? It, it was a lot, and Colchester put in like twenty-five thousand. It was a uh, um, so Lake Champlain Land Trust did it, and then Colchester put in a very small amount, and 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 it was turned over to Colchester to manage. But um, sometimes there was confusion over the years, thinking that Colchester put a whole bunch of money in there, and we actually didn't. We have Lake Champlain Land Trust to um, to thank for that. So I would be surprised if that was much of the money from. Um, I, I, it's Jack Scully that would know. Uh, I think he said that back from when there was a penny on the tax rate, which he was involved in and was on select board at the time. I thought he said to me that they, there was a property or two. I think one right near Bayside Park. I think he said to me recently that was purchased, th you know, through that, and and something was was um, that then there was no longer building on it, and that's why it's an open piece of land. So I don't believe any of that money came all the way through to the time of the Rossetti uh, purchase. I think it was involved in some other things in that time period but before it stopped um, happening. Thank you, Marilyn. It's been great. Our town clerk has digitized a lot of our old minutes going back. And so you can, through that link that I told you before, go online and check the minutes yourself. However, unfortunately, the digitized minutes don't go this far back. So. Spent some quality time in the downstairs vault. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Marty. Um, I, I, did, we didn't get all the 90s. Uh, <laughs> but um, I, I think enough to verify that we can't collect any money. There's no active funding source. So I wanted to give you a little bit of background, but thank you for adding that because I think it's helpful to fill in some of the gaps that the minutes don't. Um, so... Getting more to, I, I tried to frame this in sort of questions for you of what will a land conservation project look like? Um, and I sort of threw out that you'd have to define a project scope and purpose. Um, so the commission has been tasked with solutions for wastewater pollution. Properties with wastewater problems should be a priority for purchase. While the land in the previously proposed sewer area, 298 parcels, could be considered Lakeside properties, or 126 of them, might be a higher priority and have the highest benefit to conserve and could be the initial focus of a conservation project. So in terms of trying to like define a scope of what you'd be looking at for land conservation, just looking at the lakeside properties along West Lake Shore Drive, East Lake Shore Drive, and Goodsell Point might be a good place to start. And that's less than half of the total parcels in that area. Um, so I, I tried to sort of frame this up of you know, let's just take that as a possible example and run with there. There are a variety of different reiterations that you could do for land conservation. You could say everything in the district um, or just a couple parcels, so different reiterations. Um, how could properties with wastewater pollution be identified for conservation? And this I tried to flesh out a little bit more because I, I think there was a question of, well, could you purchase the ones that were the worst? And so I sort of ran through, and some of this you already had in your previous packets, but I think it's worth um, going through some of this detail again tonight, which is looking at the information that we have on the 298 parcels. One of the places that we looked to for data was the 2013 water quality study conducted by the town. And that evaluated the soils, the septic systems, what we had for permits, distance to surface waters, soils, ground water assessments, um, and also did some actual going out to the sites. Um, we, as part of that project and through our consultant, asked to go out onto people's sites and evaluate those areas. They couldn't visit all the ones that people replied to, 
Um, and they're also limited to the ones that people were applied to positively. We don't have a right to go out onto people's properties unless we're asked or there's visible evidence of a violation. So in the Good Cell Point area, 13 of the 49 sites were evaluated. Um, East Lakeshore Drive, which you have 62 lakeside properties and 94 non-lakeside properties, 13 of those sites were inspected. And over on Lakeshore Drive, 14 of the 43 properties were investigated. And the findings were that there's overall severe area and distance to groundwater limitations, improvements to on-site septic systems um, in the West Lakeshore Drive area could cost millions of dollars and no good cluster system options were identified by field work for West Lakeshore Drive. East Lakeshore Drive, you could possibly do cluster systems on the non-lake side. Good Cell Point, there is one potential green area that you could do a cluster system or a community septic. Um, but just to sort of pull back, it's improbable to consider a full inventory of existing septic systems. We can't legally require or perform inspections on each property. And so owners of properties with the most septic issues are also most likely to challenge that sort of investigation process. Um, but what we can tell from the 2013 study is that all these properties are subject to premature failure and not working effectively at this time. So unfortunately, being able to pinpoint specific properties that are the worst ones to try and purchase is not very probable to do. Um, so that's why just looking at, well, how do you select some just running with the lakeside properties potentially. Um, looking at ways that land can be conserved. And any questions so far in terms of identifying sites for conservation? Um, of the 13 in the East Lakeshore Drive area that were in that 2013 survey that they actually got to look at, were any of those ones that were identified as uh, full on failing? Or just so it was done in a double blind, and that was how we got onto people's properties, is the consultant had the information, they used it in their analysis, but they retained that information and they didn't provide it to us because if we were to provide that information, we'd have to take an enforcement measure against them immediately and have them fix the system. So there may have been failures, but we're not aware of them and nor can we access that information. It was, I, there are pros and cons to that. Um, we got a lot of good information out of it, but if we had asked for that information, could we have fixed some things? Yes, but people then probably would not flow us onto their properties, so pros and cons. So, yes. Um, I just had, uh, can, uh, can we talk about the timeline of this option? Is that, is that jumping ahead? It's jumping ahead a little bit. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll circle, but that's a good, good question. Okay. So you can take a look at land conservation in three sort of different buckets, if you would. One is donation. People could donate land. Um, for conservation. We have had some history of that in town in the past with people de donating um, their development rights. The Button Farm, um, north of Severance Corners, they, he donated his development rights on that property. Um, consensual purchase, so uh, things like the Rosé Park natural area, other things that we've acquired sort of like that in the past have been through people that are willing to sell. And then the third way is eminent domain. When we need um, area for um, roads or sidewalks or paths, um, we sometimes use eminent domain, which is the town actually uh, taking a property through a court process. Um, there has to be a whole lot of legal hoops to jump through, rightly so, to take a person's property, um, including that you have to have fair and just compensation. You have to arrive at that uh, mutually agreed upon purchase price. It often goes through the courts. And it um, has to be for a public good. It can't just be because the town wants to. There's been a lot of case law and courts on that. So that could be a whole nother night um, of what eminent domain is. But for right now, I'm just going to sort of breeze through the three different types. Um, and one of them is um, what would a donation policy look like? So if we set something up and said that people could donate land to the town as um, you know, families transition, uh, people could will us properties. Um, what would that look like in terms of liability to the town? Um, we would have to remove existing structures, um, stabilize the land. If you were looking at the lakeshore lots, 
Um, there are some places that have seawalls, some places that don't, depending on what you might have to do to shore up um, a property. You could be looking at anywhere from ten to $100,000 um, to stabilize a property and to demolish a property. We used an average around $25,000. It can vary so much depending on the size of the structure, the complexity of the site, if you have asbestos or other sort of environmental things that need to be remediated. Um, but we just use sort of generalities based upon some of the things that we've seen in recent permits um, that have come through. So if you were to purchase property through donation, take a property through donation, we would have probably somewhere between 35 or over $100,000 to just clear it off, stabilize it, um, cap the septic, and turn it back more to a natural site. Um, also, we'd have ongoing liabilities of moaning, pruing, just pulling garbage off, um, like some of our other natural areas if we did nothing else. Um, and you would have lost tax revenue because as properties are conserved, they come off the active tax rolls. So if you were to conserve every single lakeside property in that area, you'd lose approximately, using today's dollars, $207,000 off the grand list. And you'd lose $207,000 in annual tax revenue to the town. So that's the first one for donations. Any questions on a donation idea? Okay. So consensual purchase. Um, we'd purchase properties as people made them available to us. Um, we probably would have to pay a fair market value. Um, so we looked at the grand list to say, well, how much would that cost? And it's important to note the grand list is only 91% of market value. So you can't use the grand list and say, your, your property is this on the grand list. Here's a check. I'd like to purchase it. Most people would say, no, it's probably worth a little bit more. We're continually adjusting it and reappraising different areas so we don't fall below. There's a whole separate night that we could dedicate to the CLA and the state and requiring us to reassess. But for right now, 91% of market value roughly. So if you just focus on the lakefront properties on West Lakeshore Drive, those are on 14,949,000. On East Lakeshore Drive and Goodsell Point, they're 23 million $311,000. Um, so you'd also have to build in closing costs for real estate transactions. They could range from 1,000 to 2,000 property depending on um, how many different appraisals you did, the types of deeds. Um, you can, if you're purchasing properties through a conservation deed, go through a couple different reiterations of real estate um, evaluations for um, what the assessment is or what the property is valued at. Um, so there are some increased costs potentially with legals beyond that. But um, so you're at either 14 billion for West or East and Goodsell Point, 23 or combined, you're at $37 million for purchase. Eminent domain. Not probable the Pam? No. Okay. No. Oh, I'm sorry, Brian. Um, I think it's unrealistic to think that you'd have to, um, that the town would have to um, put up all of the money of the fair market value of the property. Um, I know the town staff is very skilled at identifying grants. We're, um, we're going to get there. Th and staff notes, hold on. It's coming. <laughs> we're getting into funding sources. So, but do you have any questions on the values so far or? Um, no, uh, but to paint the picture of buying every property along East and West Lakeshore Drive and Goodsell Point is kind of misleading. When when uh, uh, when it was first proposed, how is uh, it back, misleading? Back in the night, well, because in reality, um, what would happen last time was, as properties came up for sale, 
they were individually considered and maybe um, you know a couple per year would come up for sale and be purchased it's kind of a very slow so you're reading into my staff notes a little bit further ahead hold on <laughs> hold on to the thought okay but Just, uh, um, some big numbers you're throwing out there let's hold on to your thought yep everybody have another slice of cake or hang on um, <laughs> Eminent domain, let's get through the worst part, um, which is it's not probable that all properties would be voluntarily conserved. Um, so let's just run through what eminent domain is. Yes? Would that need a voter approval? So you need voter approval for the funding sources. So we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. But um, eminent domain is not voluntary. And the reason why I'm throwing this in is even if a purchase program was instituted over time, as properties became available, several properties may never be offered for purchase. Um, if you were interested in returning all properties to a natural state, and this is just another option, um, and only a few homes remain, the value of those homes is going to increase. And if your goal is to limit wastewater pollution, some of the worst situations could continue to exist and be used. And this is where I get a little bit into the rules. On July 2nd, we're going to talk more about the wastewater rules and what's allowed and what's not allowed. But under state wastewater rules, all property owners have a right to continue using their homes or businesses, even with a failed septic system. I used an example of 755 East Lakeshore Drive, uh, which was a seasonal residence. It was a brown structure on East Lakeshore Drive that came down last year. Um, it was condemned by the town as it was falling into the lake. The septic was unknown, it predated zoning and was likely a cesspool. The owner challenged the condemnation through litigation and the new owner uh, was allowed to, through litigation, rebuild on the site with a best fix system and possibly go to year round with a legally allowed inadequate system. So if you're looking for why might you do an eminent domain, you might run into a few of these things and if your goal is to solve the wastewater issue, um, you may have to look to eminent domain. Um, legal means such as condemnation would need to be used to acquire and conserve properties not willingly offered. Cost of legal action and the increased cost of homes as they're not factored into the cost at this time, but could substantially increase the price paid for properties well beyond the current fair market values. So eminent domain, as I said, is not to be used lightly, um, but I just wanted to offer it tonight as a tool since you're looking at all the tools in the toolbox. Can I just ask a specific question? Sure, Marilyn. So the specific property, Sarah, that you're talking about, do you know what the sale price was for that property that was falling apart and was condemned? Not off the top rough, of my head. Do you have a rough idea, like 100000 200000 300,000. Well, you have the assessed value on assessed. that, but the sale assessed purchase, um, I don't know off the top of my head what that sold for. Um, there was, there may have been more reimbursement than just the transaction price. I'm not sure in terms of legal aid potentially. Um, but I was just I was just interested in, you know, the town ended up having to go to court and it'd be interesting if mm -hmm. there was a fund and maybe that because it, the property wasn't in good shape, proper some of those properties that are real close to the lake. I was just curious what what the market rate is. Do you have on that? Do you know on, on that kind of a that's why I was asking the question. So the assessed kind of value is two hundred and forty one thousand, is it? Yeah, that's what I saw. Seven fifty five. Two forty one. So we're not sure if that's what it's sold, right. whether it's sold for less or more or whatever right. like that. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, it would be helpful if uh, you could find out what that was. Uh, the sale price? Included in the minutes. The, sa the sale price? Yes. Or the uh, The sale, like well, what, it, what the town well, we actually paid. I, I think I was using it as an example. No, um, isn't it, isn't it a, it, yeah. No, yeah. Isn't, it, isn't it, isn't it, isn't that what the actual sale price is? Isn't that just no, a public no, record? No. The oh, sale price. Um, I thought. Oh, I, I guess. If I we have it, is a public record, but yeah. sometimes yeah. it will say in consideration of. 
Uh, I see what you're saying. And so you put, put that. Yeah, it would be very interesting. Yeah, using this as an example of doing the same to other properties, it would be good to know how much that was. As, as a actual sale price, and if there's some consideration we don't know, important to note. Good, great points there. One minute. Bear with me while I see if I can tap into our assessment data. I, I will use this point to say that um, next Tuesday night before the select board meeting, I think it's at 5.30, we're having somebody that's challenging um, a health order on a cesspool too. So um, in terms of how these things play out and how long they can take to rectify even when there's a visible issue um, is interesting. Teachable moment. Yep. So let's go to ownership. It looks like it transacted last this past December and the sale price that they recorded with us was $75,000. But as I said, that's how much we have a recorded price. There may have been some legal assistance as well that was not part of the land transaction price. All right. Thank you. Going back to, okay. So we've been through the three different types of ways that you could acquire properties. How could a conservation program be implemented gradually? I think this gets to some of the questions. You need to establish a time horizon to purchase and restore properties um, to realize water quality improvement. Without a timeline to complete conservation of properties, wastewater problems could increase as additional systems fail and newly allowed inadequate systems could be installed. What? That's, what, that's the question I had. How could inadequate systems be installed? Inadequate would mean it wasn't measuring or it wasn't... Um, Best fixes are legally allowed inadequate systems. Inadequate, inadequate systems. They don't fully meet the state standards. Okay, that's what I so, um, so you need to establish some sort of a timeline. I don't know if you have more questions or if it's just. Um, Brian. Uh, do you know of any of these best fixed systems that have been installed that aren't working properly? Uh, I, know, I know I have a lot of friends that have them on Mills Point, for instance, and on Porter's Point. Um, they're those above ground ones. I know that they don't meet the, the highest standards, but they seem to work fine. Um. If I was aware of one that was in failure, we'd have to do something about it. But, and I think we're going to go into on the July 2nd meeting about the state's regulations and what's a best fix versus a fully conforming system. But just if you have an existing use of the property, the state does not allow us to say, stop the use, abandon the property just because the septic system fails. It says, what's the best type of system that you can have on that property? And there are variances for um, size and setbacks, as well as distance sometimes to groundwater. Um, so at the end of the day, we have these state regulations to ensure that we have the best possible water quality, yet we're allowing some of these systems that don't fully meet those standards. And it's understandable because you can't discontinue a use of a property. Um, these are grandfathered, but I think you have to look at them as th we have standards for reasons and these systems are not meeting those standards. So that's the short answer, but again, I think we got a lot of questions on state wastewater regulations, septic systems, and your next being, we're going to be bringing in some folks from the state, and hopefully we can get through a lot of those questions more in depth. So um, timeline. So I think we looked at what you could look at for different timelines, um, and you need to have an outer limit but with legal issues, likely in some of your land conservation efforts, um, we just threw out there a 50-year time horizon. I think it was used in 
comparable to some larger infrastructure projects life cycles or funding horizon. So let's just use 50 years. Um, and if you were to take a look at the 126 lakefront properties over a 50 year time horizon, what you could purchase and restore each year, an average property value of the 126 properties is around $303,000. Um, and if you purchase two and a half properties a year, you could get through the whole 126 over a 50 year time horizon. That would be about $759,000 a year. In addition, you'd also have to factor in the demolition site restoration and legal fees. You'd be looking at probably another 150,000. So somewhere around $909,146 a year in today's funds you could start to purchase properties within the area along the lakefront and conserve them and be done with over a 50 year time horizon. So that was just um, the simple math behind it. But if you have contested sales, um, eminent domain cases, increases property values, um, it could also increase the amount of funds that you needed. Um, Short sure time period to acquire properties, the less property values are inflated in cost. So if you dial back and looked at a shorter time horizon, um, the money that you need would be more, but you wouldn't have that inflationary factor in the value of properties. Marilyn? Are, are, are that 126 lakefront properties, is that East, Lakes, East Lakeshore Drive and West Lakeshore Drive? In Goodsell Point, yep. Okay, so I wonder how many people in this room think that, that there are problems with the waste West Lakeshore Drive lakefront properties. It's not, I just don't run into people that think that. When I drive along, I don't think that. When we did like our walk, we were on East Lakeshore Drive. I just want to, I just have concerns about lumping those two together as if they're similar when they, I don't see them as that similar. I mean, it's, it's hard to picture a house on West Lakeshore Drive along the lake that is, is in the kind of shape of the ones that most people in town would say, oh, that one on East Lakeshore Drive, I wonder, I wonder if they have a working septic. So just to go back to, and this is, I think, in task four of that 2013 study, you can look at the different areas of town and how they were evaluated. Um, there were 43 properties within the West Lakeshore Drive area. 14 of those were investigated, so it's actually a pretty high percentage level compared to some of the other areas. Is that 43 on the lakeshore side? 43 altogether. Oh, some on the high side where there's lots of land. Yep. Um. And overall, the generality from investigating 14 of those 43 was their severe, severe area and distance to groundwater limitations. And there are no good cluster systems options identified by field work. Can, can you help me understand on that cluster thing? Because when the, the IWRM says that, um, put in bold in that chart, that to increase development on West Lakeshore Drive, a sewer would be necessary. And um, it, it, there, there's, those are, there's a lot of land on that, on the non-lake side. Um, just a quick answer to I'm having trouble if I'm picturing things like um, the the large property that's the campground or even the other ones and how far back they go. How, I'm just having trouble understanding because it's not similar to East Lakeshore Drive. How is it that there's that West Lakeshore Drive is a um, that there's not a way for for those landowners with large pieces of property to put in their own community septic, for example, even. I, I so don't we're going to talk a little bit about more on July 2nd about what community septic is and what some of the limitations are with community septic and regular septic. Um, I, I think for the purpose of tonight's okay. conversation with okay. land acquisition and conservation, I think it's just um, in terms of answering your question is we're using some of this data from 2013 that went out and evaluated these sites and found that there were um, area and distance to groundwater limitations overall within the area. There are a couple larger parcels within that area um, that are not fully developed. Um, the campsite is mostly developed, 
Um, so again, you have to, when you're looking at wastewater, take a look at undisturbed natural soils. You can't take a look at there's something on it and you can remove it and then use it for wastewater. So we can get into more of that on July 2nd, but just for the sake of tonight and rolling along to West Lakeshore Drive, I believe was only 14 million out of the larger purchase price. So as I said, there are a variety of different ways to look at reiterations of how you could carve up for the purpose of how we analyzed it tonight for you guys just as a starting point it's 126 properties along the lake within the area Brian. Uh, again the same comment i think it's unrealistic to focus on the cost of buying every property along the lake shore uh, buying the entire nice and functioning neighborhood of good south point that's nobody is is advocating for that that I well, know of. Good Cell so Point is actually folks... the worst for wastewater out of the lot of them. Excuse me? Good Cell Point is the worst for wastewater out of the lot of them. It's the it's highest of the high risk areas. Could it possibly have a community septic system? There could be a community septic system on on Lone Pine Campground, which I think is very good nope, soil. Nope, that was not look no. that was not the area that was identified. Well, so again, I think we is... could get into the debating about what areas are high risk and how um, they should be looked at, but going along with the Planning Commission's charge to look at the whole area, um, I, I think is how we looked at, there are 298 properties, I think it would be, it would be $79 million to conserve the 298 properties in the sewer service area that was proposed that you've been charged to look at for alternatives. We no did not, we did not go there because that is... <laughs> A way over the top number. We looked at the 126 number just as a starting point. There are different ways of reiterating this. I'd like to um, try and get through the possible funding sources for conservation because I think that's a little bit more positive note. Um, and I think we're getting pulled into questioning what's a high risk and what's not a high risk. And that's not germane to conservation. Well, I think we're just, I think it's just hard to hear. I, I'm I'm somebody that was opposed to the sewer, but I would never be in favor of taking all the properties along the lake on East or West Lakeshore Drive. I, 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 when the town put that on their website in the in the in the information about the sewer, I felt that it was it was um, like selling fear. Like if we don't do this, we'll have to condemn all those properties. And there was this huge million figure, and so it, it's it's just to me that that isn't a a good decision. To okay. start with thinking that we would take all the properties, there's there's houses there that that Maryland's. you know I, I'm just that's what's just I think that's the same thing no, for I, Brian's I, having and I think I, if we I can just that. acknowledge that that um, even that I don't know anybody that would think that was a good idea. Maybe you guys would think it's a good idea, but it seems like a horrible idea to me to take all. It, it, to, to consider purchasing all the, what, what all the lakefront property and the inner bay. What we're trying to do is this is an option that was presented to, for consideration. Okay, and, and I'm... So, and, and so in our best an, analytical approach, we're trying to put some numbers oh. to it, start to put our arms around... Brian, you can shake your head, but we're trying to put some numbers to this and put our arms around it so we can kind of grasp okay. what we don't I, know. We don't know I, what even the beginning of the acquisition of one property was, was, much no, less all 298 and, or 126. And, and all I'll say is I love the idea of perch of of where Sarah's going and considering what would we need to do to town to have a conservation fund, which we're behind a lot of towns on. So I really love it and it's just hard to hear and put out in as if we're going to purchase them all because it's such a great idea to consider and there might be small ways to do it and that's all it's just and it yeah, just but sounds make that like we'd have to buy them yeah. all so there's there's a lot of okay layers to this onion okay and we are starting as you said at a very gross level to okay. start to get our arms around it because it was an option we said that we would consider the options that came out of May 20th, this is one of them, okay. and this is the one that we it's, thought we could And it's a great quick, thing to consider. Some quick statistical data on that we can okay. start getting a grasp of what that meant. Some of this other stuff, regulations, community yeah. No, I, I, we're still I really support everything that you're doing and what Sarah's doing. It's only the piece about as I'm if we're going to buy all the properties that's really hard. Well, I think great that's job. part of the reason why is 
And this is part of the packet information. It's up on our um, website, and Marty is also helping. I don't know how many people have used. Uh, we try to use this PlaySpeak website to try and engage the public more. I don't think many people are using it, so we're hopefully going to be switching website formats around again and getting this information a little bit better of a place to use. Um, but this is this is a workshop. These numbers are out there on the website. If you wanted to take a swag at um, just the East Lakeshore Drive properties or Good Sell Point or some of them or all of them, as I said, there are many different ways that this hole can be carved up, but we want with the more information is better than less information. Um, so it's there for you guys to choose from and to sort. That's really hard to read at that level, mm -hmm. um, but it's all there and um, just, um, you know, a good conversation started to have the information to work with. Brian, one more, and then we're going to move on to funding. Mark has oh, a oh, question. Sorry, Mark first. Quick question. I counted, um, I forget how many, but something like 26 vacant properties. Were those included in the 126? Yep. Yeah. And okay. so some of those are interesting. So the way that we do um, condos, is sometimes the land underneath, it comes up as like a zero East Lakeshore Drive. So depending on how a condo is structured, and some of those older camps have been condoized, so people own the camps, but not the land underneath, and it's all shared. Um, and then some of them are just, people have like a different like right of way or something over on the lakeside that's a small little spit of land that's not really buildable. So it's a little bit of a mixture. We didn't want to pull apart the different ones. We just threw all the Lakeshore properties in. That's every parcel. I'm just wondering if, if you're looking at the 62 East Lake Shore Lakeside, if it's actually reduced to the number of single family homes might be considerably less than 62. I'm just trying to pare the number down if it's possible. So the 62 that was in the IWRM were the, like developed parcels, I believe, not these remnant parcels or condos or what have you. Um, so good, good point. Um, funding sources? Brian, did you have one more and we, so we can clip along here? Yes. Yeah, I'd like to clarify what the option we're considering is. It was my understanding that the option under consideration was to bring back uh, the um, a funding source to purchase properties as they came up for sale the same way we did in the 90s. It seemed to work fine. We purchased one property and then for some reason, it got canceled. But I thought that was the option that we were considering, to go forward to purchase uh, one or two properties a year as they came up for sale. That's what we should be costing out. Whereas here, we are consider we're costing out the option of buying every property on the lakeshore. So we're costing out something different than the option that was, was proposed. So just, um, there are no options at this point. The Planning Commission has been charged with evaluating different ideas and concepts and getting them to the select board that would be for the select board to consider. I think the idea was just land conservation in general. Um, and so we've tried to offer some generalities because as I said, there are three different ways that you could acquire properties. Here are some of the costs associated with it. Um, it's not necessarily define and approve a land conservation program. It's just, what could this look like? How much could it cost? Um, is it possible? And so that's, I apologize. I didn't mean to scare anybody with numbers tonight. Um, I, I think we just wanted to present the numbers for as much as we could and let you guys discuss what some different reiterations might want to look like. So, Rita, do you have a question before I get into funding? I just want to say that I, I think the what I understand is we were looking at it, we were looking at this option. So we're looking at three different options. This is one of them, the way I understand it. If we're looking at a 50-year span, that's a hundred million dollars or something. But the reality is that every year it would be recommended that we purchase two properties at about $100,000. That, that's, that's the way I broke it up, okay. is that buying a couple properties a year, you could get to the full 126. So it's not... Over 50 years. Yeah. Right. Okay, that's what I heard. 
But as I said, just different options, different ways of looking at it, um, different pros and cons, but possible funding sources. And Marty is very helpful with researching what are some of the possible granting sources, some of the partners that we've used in the past. Um, a lot of things that we haven't bought on the bond, we've definitely, I think you've heard some great testimonials to some of the work of our partners in the past that we've conserved land with. Um, and so there are active organizations you have in your um, packets um, about known sources, but I think some of the things is most of these organizations don't go it alone. I think Rossetti was a great partnership there are different partners in it. They look to partner up with different people. So you can't necessarily just select one of those off the list and say, we're going to go back to that year after year for the purchase of properties and they're going to solely fund it. There aren't those sorts of grant opportunities out there, but there is the ability to partner with different people. Uh, funding varies substantially um, depending on the organization and what's used for. I think there are some that were more for a conservation purpose and there are some that were um, more for water quality and more specific environmental um, issues. So if you tapped one or two of these um, funding sources for one or two of the parcels, um, you could start to leverage some of these properties together. Um, you need to, however, at the end of the day, have a way to match. So the town would have to give money, even on Rossetti, we had to find some sources of funds to contribute towards that land conservation effort. We can't rely wholly upon outside organizations or the kindness of others. Um, so I went through, well, what way does the town get its funding? There are two ways that we get our funding, which is either through fees for service, which are things like building permits, dog licenses and the like, or through the um, grand list and property taxes. And so I did throw out there that a conservation of properties could not be a fee for service. It's something that we could leverage as part of a building permit. So you'd have to look at the property taxes as a source of funding, similarly to what they did in the early 90s, late 80s. Um, this would increase your property taxes while well, you're also conserving properties and taking them off the grand list and increasing the tax burden on all the people remaining on the grand list. So it would be a little bit of a double whammy um, where you'd have to be increasing taxes to conserve land and that act would also increase taxes as well. What percentage of the grand list was that? You said a number, but what's the percentage? So if you remove all 126 properties from the grand list, um, at this time, it would be $207,000 that you lose in property taxes. That's the number or what's the denominator? Sorry, your name for the record? Daniel Bell, Freddie Road, 207 is the numerator out of? 126 properties. No, um, the total grand list. The total grand list. was around $37 million. Dollars? So it's less than one percent. So West Lakeshore Drive was fourteen thousand nine hundred forty-nine fifty, and Good Sell Point was, and East Lakeshore Drive was twenty-three million three hundred eleven nine nine twenty-five. Less than tenth of a percent. Okay. So it's about a second. Taxes raised on the entire grand list mm -hmm. versus. So the, those, those 126 properties contribute $207,000 a year in property taxes. What's the total property taxes? That's the what, denominator. What's the total? Yeah. For the town? Yeah. I, not off the top of my head. That's the, yeah. I mean, 207 is meaningless without knowing what the total is. What's the effect on the, the So the effect is that you lose $207,000 coming in property taxes. That's actual property taxes that we use to keep the lights on in this building, police cars, what have you. So that's $207,000 in lost revenue. So the question becomes, like, I think what you're driving to is what would the offset be in the increase? What's the what is that per, as a percentage of the yeah. total ground of the total property taxes paid per year? So you have to ask what's the town budget? <laughs> I, I left my select board binder at home and I was going to bring it to you because we just did the uh, 
Hold on. Let's let's see what we can find. We'll find it. Yes, me. Well, name. You, know, you keep talking about losing losing those properties and losing tax dollars, but there's a lot of building going on in Colchester, and Colchester has a huge, the largest land mass in just Chittenden County. So mm -hmm. I mean, the building's not stopping. I mean, you're not even considering that when you in your numbers. I mean, I, that. That adds a whole another dimension mm -hmm. to As I said. what your tax base would be decreased or probably be increased. Mm -hmm. It's about one percent a year that we grow in the grand list, um, and that's also you have to take into account with operationally our costs increase. So the grand list increases every year, but our costs to provide services also increase. So there are a variety of different factors. Um, but I think we wanted to provide values tonight of just what would it mean in terms of cost to purchase, cost of lost revenue. Um, so again, not looking to go into our budget currently. Budgets can increase or decrease over years too in terms of what percentage that is, but just in terms of what that would be for lost um, revenue. So All right. Not easily available on the website. Oh. Note to self. Note to self. Okay. We're redoing our website too, so this has been a lightning process. But. So we could just say for argument's sake right now, if you don't know what the grand list is, that 200,000 uh, is probably less than one tenth. No, no, you're list. misinterpreting. That's, it's. That's, that's what we're trying to find. Yeah, that's the, what we're trying to understand. Trying, or, or the total tax what, is taken What percentage in the, of the grand list is this lost revenue per year? So it's not of the grand, grand list, it's of, of the taxes. taxes. Right. The tax revenue. That's what, that's which is why we were saying so, what's tax revenue. No, sorry. It's over 10 million at this point? Yeah. yeah. It's over 10 million at this point. It's. Oh, well, hold on. Okay. Nope. I don't want to. Does the town report have the town budget in it, Pam? No, no, I brought the uh, town plan. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Hold on. I'm getting into our assessors. And I love the uh, Bob's abstract at home. Assessment records. Yeah, it's gonna bring Grand list. Hold Here on. Or the town budget. So the grand list. Okay, I can give you grand list information. Yeah, I don't want the grand list. I want the budget. No, it's more than that. Yes, our website is undergoing a redesign process. Um, we agree that this information could be better served on the website. My apologies, but we are working on a better website at this point. Yep, I could download the grand list, but that's not the tax rate. Yep. We voted on it. Whatever it was, we voted on doing. We voted on it in <laughs> March. <laughs> Did we approve a bunch of We approved it. <laughs> Hold on. So it's kind of funny that we all voted. And yeah. I just can't remember, like, what was that figure? How much money we were spending? What were we writing the check out? We did out vote in March. It's like your kids' age. <laughs> Never goes down. Town meeting and budget. <laughs> okay. Ballot items. Getting there. 20 FY20 budget. So yeah. it's combined operating budget and capital fund. <laughs> We're not stopping. Net of non property increase. Combined operating capital funding. So this 
Estimated tax rate for FY 2020 was at town meeting 0.54, um, and that was an increase of seven tenths of one cent. Well, just an for increase. argument's sake, the capital budget here was eleven million dollars. Yep, it's eleven like million seven hundred forty-four. So forget the operating; it's probably closer to twenty million dollars. So it's 207,000. Nope, the combined operating budget and capital funding is 11 million. Okay. So 11 million. 11 million, or 207 into 11 million. Jeanette, you've got the calculator. Somebody does. Which, Martin, which is the. Your fingers? <laughs> once again, we're looking at the figure if you take away all those properties, which I don't know anybody proposing right, that. But that's point. Gross numbers, right? But Nearly. you know what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, that would be, and that would take how many years to get? 50 years to get to. So we're we're looking 50 years out in this figure where we're just talking, you know, what maybe somebody sells a property that isn't worth a lot, and we had some conservation fund money, and gosh, we'd have a view. <laughs> sort yep. of a 40 foot house. Yep. If the funds had been maintained in the late 80s, early 90s, that would be something. Um, but, 1.8. 1 1.8, thank you. Okay, 1. great. 50 years out. <laughs> I mean, 50 years total, right? It's well, in taking a look at uh, grand list goes up and it goes down, taxes go up or go down. This is, again, right now. Is it 7,000 if we do 50, the, the purchase are all, in, which is the 50? Yeah, so if you yeah, take that 1.8 percent, the, the 50th a year, it's no yeah, because it would take a long time to, to get there. All right, so moving on to, so yep, we had just sort of made it through funding, and we're coming back to character of the area, um, because that was one of the things on your spreadsheet that you identified as wanting to look at as to how would these things impact the character of the area. And so I, I think what I tried to lay out was a balanced look at things, which is when you um, conserve land and neighborhood, um, there are positive impacts such as the adjacent properties or lake views that was mentioned, um, opened up in green areas created. Um, there could be some negative impacts for the residences and businesses in the, the area um, as long term families. And we do have some families that aren't own, own property long term, maybe you look to transition and move. Um, you move away from some of that summer seasonal character of the area. Um, properties could be redeveloped back into a passive park that could be a draw for tourists in the community. However, a lack of parking and amenities could prove problematic in considering the area as a destination. Residents might not want a higher influx of tourists or possible increases in traffic. That was one of the things that we heard also at the forum. People were concerned with any increase in traffic or people coming in and out of the area. A relocation of long-term residents and a lack of seasonal influx would also have a lasting impact on the community. So there are some pros and cons with um, how it could impact the character of the area. Um, and then also one of the sort of check boxes that you have is how would it impact water quality? And if a strategic plan was to purchase, conserve, and restore properties with wastewater pollution concerns um, fully implemented, it could have the highest impact on water quality mm -hmm. of the three um, solutions under consideration. Buildings, parking, and other impervious areas could be restored. Um, remove the septic systems, um, abandon them, decreasing stormwater runoff as well as wastewater pollution. Conserved lands could be used for revegetation with natural land cover and plantings improving the shoreline environmentally. Um, so it would overhaul, most likely have a very good impact on water quality. So this was just looking through, you developed a matrix with some general categories of how to evaluate the different options. And again, I think we, Talk, Pam, there are different ways to slice the onion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's You could do it in a variety of different ways. We could have done 50, 100 different reiterations, but just for the sake of starting someplace, throwing out numbers, um, just wanted to start to give you some data to mull over and looking at those check boxes again in terms of water quality, cost, timeline, and happy to answer questions or take questions and Commission, go ahead, Serena. Yep. Um, so 
I had asked before how many gallons, if we know how many gallons of E. coli are being dumped into the bay every day, like what that figure is, because I'm, I'm... No, but the area right now, as it was looked at, produces about 90,000 gallons a day of wastewater. Okay. Yes, that's right. I, the that's survey showed 8% of the E. coli in the lake was human origin. Right. So yep. you're going to have an, for E. coli, you're going to have an 8% impact. Right. But Without they were really severe causes. areas. You know, the, if you look at the map that the study did, they, I don't remember that. Uh, there's, they, they identified um, really very severe areas. And, right. and this uh, East Lakeshore, Bissell Point, and um, West Lakeshore were, I think West Lakeshore, which was surprising to me, was almost the most severe, one of the most severe so areas. So the water quality okay. testing map is up on the town's website, and I think it's actually linked now off the main page. Again, something that we're looking to better link in with tinyurl.com backslash Colchester MBI. Um, so we'll have a barrel link to that as well, but those maps and those tests are available on our website. So with this option, we would, it would have to be that either people willed their property to us, they sold their property to us, or we took over the property. So if, if this was the option, is that how we would access the property? I'm just those are just three different ways of acquiring property. Yeah. Um, again, I, I think you guys were given the land conservation is a viable alternative. How much would it cost? Um, or some of the different ways. And not necessarily that you have to select one of the options, just these are all different possible tools to accomplishing a land conservation program. And can we use local option taxes? Again, that would be one of the tax revenues. Okay. Gotcha. As opposed to a fee I for just service. To say to Marty, I really like the data you collected. That was You're welcome. Um, I think that there is kind of a maybe a mismatch here where there's a conservation option that isn't so much directed at water quality. It's more about um, enhancing the scenic beauty of the lake and kind of beautifying the Lakeshore Drive. And that would like kind of be what happened in the 90s where they just took a couple properties, like trimmed a couple here and there, whereas our focus is more on water quality. And so for water quality, we would have to address all of the all the high risk properties and we want to get rid of them as soon as possible in order to improve water quality. And so that's why our numbers seem a lot different than yours because we're not, I don't think we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about getting rid of all the properties so that way there's no more wastewater going untreated into the lake. Whereas a conservation tax- well, There were other properties in the survey that drain in the lake that aren't on the lake. Right, but these are the only, these are the high risk ones. Right, only the, there's right. some up the hill that do. Right, but those were classified as lower medium. Risk. Right. Yeah. So, I don't think that this was not an evaluation of a conservation tax for the purpose of trimming one or two properties a year and making Lakeshore Drive better over time. This was, we evaluated the possibility of getting the water quality as high as possible in the shortest amount of time. And so that's why some of the numbers are really startling and they don't really seem maybe feasible. But this, uh, this, this model assumes that every property is in that high risk category and has to go. No, Which it doesn't. Nope, it doesn't. Um, because again, there are 298 parcels within the area, and we only looked at 126. Well, no, and it was just, as it said, it could have carved them up a variety of different ways. But again, looking at for water quality purposes, we took the lakefront ones alone. There are different ways that you could do it. You could have just done it for Goodsell Point, East Lakeshore Drive, Lakeside. Um, it's interesting. And going back through, what were some of the town's thought processes in the past? And looking through some of the minutes and the ballot items that were passed, it was the 127 corridor and it was Lakeshore property. The 127 corridor is pretty huge. It's all of Heinberg, Prim, West Lakeshore Drive. I think it may have been East Lakeshore Drive at that point instead of coming up Blakely. Um, so it was, the ballot items were very generalized. Um, so again, different thought processes over the years. It would have been nice if that had been continued annually. Uh, we'd be in a different perspective. And again, those properties probably would have cost a lot less to purchase at that time. But, um, you know, I, I really, I think we were trying to just provide information for the sake of coming up with ideas. We didn't mean to startle anybody with numbers. We didn't mean to 
um, turn anybody off to it. If anything, I think it sort of looks at those early efforts of the 80s and 90s and sort of validates those, some of those things that were attempted at that time. Um, if it had been put in place, you could have had something much better, but using today's numbers, it is difficult. I think we tried to come up with a two and a half per year over a time frame that you could accomplish it. Um, but any other things that we didn't provide you that you would have liked to have seen for information? It's a bit much to weed through too, so maybe it could be reiterated in a different way. Just the process by adding two cents on the property tax, what is that process? That would be a ballot item. Like a year away or? So um, the select board works to set our budget and ballot items. You can have the select board uh, move forward the, through the warning and hearing process to put things on the ballot. You can have petitioners put things on the ballot too. So there are a couple of different ways of doing that locally, um, but it would be something that would have to go to a townwide vote. I don't know. You guys flip a coin over there, Marilyn or Brian, whichever wants to go first. Brian. I didn't get a chance to uh, comment on the funding go ahead. part. Um, Sarah mentioned working with partners um, uh, and uh, getting grant monies that would have to be matched. Um, in the conservation projects that I've worked on in the past, uh, I've worked with the Lake Champlain Land Trust. Um, uh, I was on the board director for a while. Um, uh, generally, the local match is uh, um, with high priority projects that have to do with um, uh, public access or water quality. Generally, the match is uh, around 20%, sometimes 10%. Um, other f uh, funding options, uh, we could reconsider um, transfer of development rights. I think that's still a tool uh, in the toolbox that's mentioned in the town plan. It's not, hasn't been used, um, but I believe it's still mentioned in the town plan, at least it was in the last one. Uh, it was suggested that it stay in the town plan. I haven't read it yet, um, but that creates a really great incentive for landowners on the lakeshore um, to transfer the development rights to non-lakeshore uh, parcels or parcels that uh, have better septic um, Capacity, especially if you're looking for increased density on on, uh, on uh, properties that do have good septic capacity, uh, the local options tax. Uh, that's another way of, of funding this. That could that could raise all of the money for the local match. So this all could be funded in its t entirety uh, by using just a small portion of the local options tax. Um, Vermont Housing and Conservation Fund. Um, that's, again, one of the partners that, that uh, uh, Sarah was referring to. Um, and another option is uh, uh, conservation tax. Uh, uh, penny for parks, a penny for open space. Um, I could be wrong, but I believe we're the only town in Chittenden County that doesn't have a conservation fund. Um, so just doing that. So any one of those options would uh, reduce our cost to zero for all of this even if we look at the big picture. Great, thank you. You know, we actually don't have to come up with funding. We actually, all we need to say is that this is the best physical option to take, send it to the select board, and they can argue it out how to pay for it. We don't actually have to come up with any funding. We can say, go all sewers again and figure out how to pay for them, or take everything down and figure out how to pay for them. Our charge was not to figure out how to pay for this, correct? Correct. Right. So just so you know, no, just our end results of this whole deal may not have anything to do with funding. Yeah, and no, we just may just say this is our best option how to fix what we think is a problem with that. I just think all the funding options should be noted. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. so. so you had, Marty, you had a, a matrix of all the funding options, right? Can you? Yeah. You had all the it's different. It's in the staff notes. Can you pull that up? Um, one is, you, you said that um, they, they probably would look at this as a public health we Go up to under two funding source memo. And, and that, yeah. that probably, they probably wouldn't be really uh, willing to fund it. But 
can you show that list of all the different funding exactly. sources yeah, that you I'll fix the view. Um, yeah, and I'm sure that Brian has uh, like a lot more experience than I do in terms of coming up with land, land trust um, partnerships and stuff. I just went through, I think it was 15, um, throughout the state of Vermont and also uh, some like national ones. And just based on perusing their website, uh, looking at their mission statement, um, identifying past projects that they've worked on. I'm sorry, this is small. Um, but it looked like a lot of them weren't interested in purchasing already developed land. Like, for example, Rossetti Natural Area was purchased because it was a natural area and they wanted to preserve it as opposed to purchasing some rundown camps on East Lakeshore Drive. Like, I don't think that many of the organizations would be interested in that per se. Um, there were several organizations, especially the EPA and the Vermont Department of um, Environmental Conservation that would be probably willing to work with us um, to a greater degree than perhaps like, for example, um, the Vermont River Conservancy or the Trust for Public Land. Is it, oh, the Trust for Public Land is there. Yeah, yeah that's, a good, that's a great list of potential grant sources, but I'd mm -hmm. just like to, uh, if you could include on that list things like transfer of development rights, uh, local options tax, and a conservation tax. And these were just funding sources for like granting organizations. There are also different funding types, as Rich said, in terms of like taxes or things like that. Um, I, I think we just wanted to provide a positive, well, here are some other possible partners that could be used with outside of the property tax or regulatory uh, environment to help. But suggestions for different funding mechanisms, like I suggested, they'll be forwarded to the select board? Um, possibly. I, I think what we're looking at is, I, I think as Rich said, we're not to necessarily identify a funding source but identify a preferred solution. Is that, did I get that? Correct. We've been charged with a select board to do a pretty specific area and what's the best fix. Right. Well, they didn't know. ask us how to pay for it. We, they, that's just not gonna be what we do. We're not a finance committee. We're, we're looking at what's the best idea to but fix the they problem. They must have asked you how much is it gonna cost because that's what we've been it's part of the. Time. It's part of the, what we'll look at probably to make a decision what we think is the best way to go. But we don't have to tell, the select board doesn't even have to listen to us as far as how It'll to fund it. It'll be an element, thing. it's up to them to determine the mechanism on how they, how they want but to get there. That. That'll be your argument. Across the goal line. Yeah, when we'll get to the select board, you can fix. actually go to them and yeah. bang it so out with them. Right. I'm sorry? So you're saying best fix, that's what you're charged with, the best fix. So the problem is the water quality. It's not scenic beauty or anything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's exactly. That's a side effect. Right. Right. It'd be nice option. to say the whole well, package. Well, but that's the what problem statement is improve the water quality. Right. Yeah. Yep. And I would assume it's in the shortest amount of time. They even... Has, is that, would that be a correct assumption? Uh, I think the... I think as was sort of stated is your task from the select board is to identify solutions for wastewater pollution. There's not necessarily a time horizon, an amount, or what have you, but it's to quickly evaluate what the different options are and provide them with that analysis. Mm -hmm. So again, you might have three or four different options, and going back to that matrix, it sort of gives you the option that you can go through. I don't know if you want to pull up the matrix that we had coming out of the 20th. It's just to sort of elaborate what's, how you sort of fill in these different boxes and here's the options that you have so far on the table. That might increase, um, but that's what you're working with right now. And just be able to provide a statement under each in terms of um, also what potential funding sources are. You don't need to be exhaustive in that, but I think you've heard some tonight. Um, there are some grant organizations, there are taxes or what have you um, under regulatory incentives. But um, I think we tried to go through in our staff notes effect on character of the neighborhood, effect on property values and taxes, um, and water quality. So this was, again, your working draft of how you wanted to evaluate these options. Do you think we should have a time column there, like in terms of, you know, because- It's an estimated implementation timeline. Oh, great, perfect. It's Mark, did you have a comment? Well, I mean, not to disagree with Rich, but I think we have to consider feasibility. If at the end of this we say the best option is to tear down um, 126 houses and it's going to cost 70 million dollars and it's completely unfeasible, well, I agree with we that. Accomplish very much. No, and I agree with that. That would be definitely one of my decisions 
you know, well, look at feasibility, but what I'm saying is we're not going to say how to do it. Or we can suggest it, but the select board's still going to do what they do. We're not even, we're not, we we're even it as separated. Being a favorable option, we should have some idea as to whether it's feasible. And not. I agree that that will be our decision, I'm sure, because that, that you're already thinking about that now. So when your time comes and we all make a decision, that'll be part of our process. I mean, it's pretty narrow minded. It took me a while to even get here. We're not even looking at stormwater runoff, we're looking at straight up wastewater for a selected area, best fix. It's hard to stay focused because there's a lot of puzzle pieces Wait to the whole thing, and I understand that. With the state trying to clean up the lake and annoyance they're putting into that, is there any possibility that the legislative, um, would be some legislation that would affect failed systems? July 2nd. July 2nd. We're going to talk about, we'll hear about that. Rules yep. and regs on July 2nd. July 2nd. So it's come back. We'll have. We'll try and have some ice cream that night as yeah. opposed to just the cake. We're going to have. <laughs> it's, uh, we're working with uh, Minuski. Natural, NRCD, uh, Natural Resource Conservation District in the state of Vermont have funding. Um, they're going to be bringing what they call septic social to us on that. And so we'll, uh, we, we've been joking that we're going to have brownies and lemonade. Um, and we're going to get into some of those more specifics on septic. So yes, um, there's a lot to get through in a very short period of time during the summer. And as you can see, there's a lot of information, different reiterations. Scott, did you have a comment? I just had a question about, um, you know, to say that on the ballot that we voted on in March, as yes. I said, the, the numbers were six to eight percent of human. Eight point five. Yeah. So say, um, if you buy every piece of property on the lake that's for sale and clean it up, how what percentage of that eight percentage is it going to fix? Has anyone come up with a number? Is it going to magically reduce that number to zero? So, we don't know. That's the thing is we taking a look at the whole area as being a high risk and I think what we we're saying is the only way that you could get that to zero is maybe with the 298. Um, and the second part of the question, especially when we're addressing water, um, at the last one it still it still boggles my mind that we're talking about water quality, but they're still address they're still talking about developing the Bayside Hazel property, which is a natural sand plane. Like, especially it's right across from the thing when Burlington just barely on Arbor Day put in 1,200 trees and the first thing out of there when they said is like especially this being that close to the lake you should be planting stuff. Well come back in August we're looking at that as a community septic site. We don't have our August dates lined up yet but we will be discussing that as community septic site on our, our August meetings. Brian. Good to see a list of the options that are being considered uh, that came from the last meeting. May 20th. Um, yeah. There are a lot of comments at the last uh, meeting about the um, hanging our hat on the testing that we've done in the past and that many parts of town, uh, Lakeshore, have not been tested. And my suggestion at that meeting was that we um, uh, just take a year off and do a year of comprehensive water quality testing of our entire lake shore from the Winooski River to the Lamoille River, all 30 miles of lake shore. Um, that could be funded with the local options tax, and I'd like to see that as, as an option. You said, Sarah, that there could be more options. Uh, I'd like to see that uh, as an option to be, uh, to consider the cost and benefits of. Well, to be clear, the, the um, task that we've been given as the Planning Commission, we've been given a timeline to wrap this portion up with right. our recommendations, and right. that could be one of them, yes. but as by September. Right. So we're time certain we're, we don't have a year to collect more data to roll into any further analysis. No, it, we've got till September, but if you're saying another option for the select board to extend no, I'm not saying, an analysis. I'm not saying to do the testing before September. I'm saying no. I understand. Just take another year. Chosen, same as the do nothing option. Sure. Okay. Take another year. Yeah. Sure. Now, is that, are, okay. Has any water testing done in, in the winter? Do they only do? It, is anyone going out and actually yeah. drilling a hole in, in every Monday? Well, I know this the guy from the state here. At the, he's at the parks. I see him every uh, yeah. Monday, and Wednesday morning. Yeah. But sessions. not when the lake's not, frozen. It's not the entire yeah. No. Time. Not when the lake's frozen. Bacteria doesn't live when it's frozen. Right. E. coli needs certain conditions to grow, and when the water reaches 32 degrees, and no, it's not growing. 
you wouldn't get any useful information out of that. Can I just clarify something? Because I think this has been brought up before. My understanding is that 213 study, that four year study, looked at all the water, all the different water sources in Mallet's Bay. It did. It, it did. It did. No, it okay, so that, that's where I think, I mean, I, I'm thinking it did. So that's why we're targeting this area because this area was targeted as the most severe. No, it didn't test Mallet's Creek. It didn't test Porter's Point. It didn't I think test, it did, though, Ryan. Uh, uh, did you? Point. I, um, I thought it did. When I read it, I thought it did. The town does um, testing on um, both bays, the inner and the outer bay, right. two days a week for 90 days out of the year during yeah. the warm months. But this was a study. This was a four-year and it built upon previous testing that was done by the state of Vermont. The state of Vermont, in determining what areas of the lake and its feeders are impaired, has done testing as well. Um, and so there are areas that we knew that were impaired for E. coli, which required further testing. There are areas that were not impaired for E. coli that did not require additional further testing. Um, so this is there's a whole lot of work done by a variety of others over the years that has been built upon. And I noticed we're having some speakers come in. It looked like we're having some speakers yes. from the state come in. I'm, I'm wondering if they could address that. I mean, because it seems like that's an area that really needs to be. So I, I think you could have, I think as uh, Rich said, you could go down a few different shoots on this in terms of stormwater and water quality testing for stormwater, which is different than for wastewater. Mm -hmm. And so we're not going to have speakers in about water quality testing mostly for stormwater, no, no. Um, just for wastewater. And I, I think we're going to talk about wastewater solutions, but going back and re-examining a lot of this data is something that we do not have time for this summer. Uh, we're using existing data sources as best as possible. We are bringing in outside speakers and sources to try and help wade through the data that we have and the possible solutions, but again, we don't have the time, the budget, um, or um, I guess the lack of constraints, <laughs> ability um, to go out and create new data sources at this no, point. No, I'm just saying that it's already been done, and for some reason, I'm feeling you don't think it's been done, and you're, we're saying I think that it has been done. We have that data now, I, and I'm just trying to clarify that. Because right. It, it, I, I think we could spend a lot more time tonight going through the different data sources and what people um, have read into them or not read into them. Um, but I think to try and keep focused on, I, I think in terms of staff um, solution tonight, land conservation, um, we're going to have other work sessions on different things. But is there any additional information that you need to be able to evaluate the land conservation option? tonight or that you'd like to see brought to you in the future to better evaluate land conservation um, or do you whoop let's <laughs> the it's getting late the computer wants to shut down let's not do that um, <laughs> um, what what additional data do you need or um, do you feel like you've covered some of the ground on land conservation well is there data on if say one system completely failed and dumped into the lake what that would affect the water quality like burlington. it's going to depend so much on the site with okay. burlington it's actually easier in some ways it's better to calculate because they have a straight pipe that goes out yes. depending on what your failure is how deep is that system in the ground what sort of soils are you dealing with what's the travel time of that water to the lake or additional water body um, are you dealing with dry conditions? Or are you dealing with wet conditions where anything that's surfaced up in the lawn is sheet flowing across the lawn and over the road into the lake? Is there a catch basin nearby? So that's why in terms of, I, I think I tried to summarize in the staff notes that getting specific information on which are the worst parcels is very improbable. And to do that sort of additional data that I think we'd all love to have where we went on to every single site and tested every single system we're just not going to have. People won't allow us onto their sites to do it, and without that, um, no, we'll never have a complete inventory. I, I know, but. You know, what would the effect be of if 
20 gallons of wastewater got spilled into the bay. And again, that's going to depend on, well, what time of the year is it? Is it during the winter? If it's during the winter, E. coli can't grow, so it's probably but going it's to be... More of a scientific question. It is, and there are so many variables with that sort of a process, and, and I think that's why, just to speak honestly, in terms of people, uh, well-thinking people, even people with scientific backgrounds, trying to grasp about percentages and gallonage, there are so many different variables and so many different ways of looking at this, it becomes very hard to wrap your head around. And you can't get to a concrete of if one system at a particular location had a failure, how many E. coli does that create? There's no methodology that we can deploy unless you were to factor in all the variables in terms of was it during a 60 degree day? Was it dry conditions? What were the soil conditions? Um, and that gets into there are probably as many variables with that as there are with the land conservation. Best I can do as your staff person is give you the numbers and let you sort through what we have. And maybe probabilities, you know, as opposed to the answers. Just, you know, if we do this, the probability looks like it would be this. Yep. And I think it's great that you guys are trying to wrap your heads around this and sort through it. I think you're asking a lot of the questions I heard from the May 20th forum. Um, Marilyn? I, I appreciate the um, discussion. I appreciate the questions. I know that we all care about the water quality, and it comes back to what he was saying. We're talking about water quality. Um, in the end, any of these things are a lot of money. And we really want to be sure that we're going to make a difference in water quality, which is why the, it is a really important question, what's been raised around what water quality testing we've done, what can we do to make sure whatever we do is going to make some kind of a difference, especially when the E. coli testing was showing that less than 10% was from human sources, and we're not actually looking at the 90%, we're only looking at the like less than 10%. So we've really got to, to do everything we can to make sure whatever we decide is going to help the lake, because we actually all, even if we have different opinions on things, we all really want that to happen. I think that's where the uh, Northern Lake Champlain Tactical Basin Program, just a few years ago, after the IWRMB, said that a Colchester was going to consider something like a sewer, it should actually do more water quality testing first, because to narrow things down more, which we really, like, some of the water quality testing was where the streams are coming out. Well, that is really important, because the runoff is a huge issue, which is why, you know, such a small percentage is the human, but we are looking at this human piece. So those data points that are where the streams are coming in, we need data points in front of the camps that we're actually talking about. And could we this summer start, like, could we get 10 data points? Like, how many data points actually in front of the camps and not at the streams, um, you guys can look, you know, look at that report and see what that was. Did we have, like, one data point? You know, um, like, so if we can't go on the properties, we're trying to deal with what we can, and our hands are sort of tied, well, what can we do? And, and I really think we need better information, and it has been said that we should have that, and what would it cost to do that starting right away compared to the cost of whatever choices? any of us in town can, you know, whatever you come up with to the select board or whatever we do, it's just such a teeny piece. And as we've all pointed out, winter's long here, <laughs> summer short, and, you know, gosh, could we, um, what, would, what would it take to really test some of the water from those camps? None of us really know where we're going to find out. You know, it isn't like, I know we're going to find out or something of those different things, you know, it's like we just, we don't really know. We don't have a lot of data of, of data points, and we're in summer, and we have a real 
opportunity here. We could maybe know a lot by the end of the summer, just like that water quality testing um, shows. Um, you know, we've, we've learned so much about storm water, and now we know, oh, it's the rain events that increase the E. coli, and our storm water person that, you know, like tells us that, and that's what closes Bayside Beach, and, and that's really our, it, it isn't the only thing we care about, but it's the indicator for most of the town that doesn't follow things and try to figure them out as closely as you guys. And we know that if only, um, if less than 10% of the E. coli is, is from human sources, that no matter what we do to help here, statistically it shouldn't even change the closings of Bayside Beach once because we're not addressing the, the, the 90% and, and that's, you know, that's what's, you know, we, it, it shouldn't be the only thing we care about, but it's the, it's the big indicator. You know that, that that we all have, and so one I really encourage thinking if there's some kind of something we could do for that, and you'd all feel a lot better at the end saying, oh, I got a little more info, and okay, maybe we do this or that. It's really interesting how Sarah pointed out that um, this uh, question about. Um, you know, everybody knows the less development by the lake, the better that is for water quality. <laughs> and, you know, we've got a history of wonderful family camps, and they used to be summer camps, and then they became year-round. And, you know, now we have this really difficult question as a town, what do we do? Um, but um, I, I lost my train of thought <laughs> because I was thinking about... I was thinking about those camps. Well, basically, it's a difficult question that, that we have as a town. And so back to what the, what you're considering tonight, it's interesting that Sarah said this could have the, have the best impact on improving water quality. I thought that was a really interesting statement she made. Because, oh, there's actually um, there's, there's less development along the lakeshore. <laughs> and we don't have things, you know, we, we don't have any septics that uh, might not be working right. And so one of the things maybe to consider is if, it, it, could it, some of these properties that don't cost so much because they haven't been able to be fixed up or whatever, if, if we come up, um, town purchase of properties, I would encourage you not to consider eminent domain um, in what you're considering. If the town needs to do that for some reason, because it's going that direction, I view that as a different thing. That's a particular piece of property the town might have to do. But for what you guys are considering, um, I think considering eminent domain would, um, what I've heard Jack Scully explain about the, the one the penny on the tax and how that went for a few years, that there was a property owner or two along the lake that didn't understand that was just or, or that was just for properties that came up for sale and somehow thought it was going to turn into that their property would be taken like under eminent domain. Mm -hmm. So that kind of fear was what, and I believe from what I've heard, there were some people that were involved in town policy who were like, let's stop that. So I would encourage you when you're considering these not to go that way that it can be misinterpreted and property owners can think, oh, are they going to like take away my property? Um, that it's it's really the um, we we ha we don't have a good record as Sarah did such a good job and and, and our helper here <laughs> pointing out we don't have a good a good record in town of having money for conserving properties mm -hmm. and most mm -hmm. towns in Jimmy County do so there might be some way like I love what um, Sarita had asked it's the same question I had maybe there's a way because now we have the local option tax. And we know we have to vote for doing something on that. You know, there's a tax we already have. Maybe there's a small piece of that that could be, you could look into, is there a way to put it aside in a conservation fund? And we could maybe vote on that and start putting some money in the conservation fund. And now, because that's something Cold Sisters not had and other towns in Chittenden County do, and oh, maybe that, and, and say, okay, so we're ready for when some properties come up. And, Yes, it would have been better in the 80s and it was short-sighted of us as a town, but we don't want to look at this 50-year timeline in 50 years saying, oh, why didn't we like consider how that was going to impact water quality? Um, and when we went on that walk on East Lakeshore Drive, I know that none of us can know which ones are failing. And I know that we all really want to know, like, how do we solve the failing ones? But maybe some of these like limited purchase when people are selling them 
and the ones that aren't so expensive because they're not pumping to the other side and they can't sell for as much, you know, like maybe this could really help in the water quality, on the water quality issues. And, and that's what we're looking at. And at the same time, the, the residents of the town also benefit because look at the re reaction when the 40-foot houses started going up. And we all got what that area could look like. Um, so one of the things you might want to, it just occurs to me, you might want to have a, a column there about character of the town. Of, of, of the town. Because, uh, oh, in fact, I never heard character. Great, you do have it. Because, because you put a sewer in somewhere and you increase your, you, you, you know, you're increasing your development potential. And that's what happens all over the country. No matter what a good job you guys do trying to control it, it's just how it works and you see it all around the country. Versus something smaller like this um, could have a positive impact for the taxpayers of the town um, because it's so beautiful to drive through the bay. Thanks, Thank Marilyn. You. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Sarah, I've got one question. Um, Did we, I'm not sure what is your name. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Carol Woods. I'm Thanks, Carol. Thank you, Carol. Um, Thank you. Um, I was wondering too, I mean, the state has low interest loans for people with failed systems. I mean, I think it's 3%. Their system has to be failed. And so unfortunately, there are some people, funding where they can't qualify for regular funding sources. But I mean, even But there is that fund, yes. Yeah, and if incomes, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars people Make and then still qualify for this I'm not sure of the particulars. There's a link to it from our planning and zoning website. So if you go to ColchesterVT.gov and planning and zoning, there's a link to the state's program. Um, there are some caveats. I think it has to be owner occupied and there is some income sensitivity. Um, but yes, there is a program out there for people. Um, I think it's a 3% interest over 20 years to replace their there's septic systems. So that's one of the great things about administering the state program locally is we do try and work with people and make them aware of that. There's also a new one from CHG, Champlain Housing Trust. Um, so we do try and point people in the right direction for funding um, and make them aware of it. We have handouts too, but um, again, you have to qualify for it and it doesn't fit everybody's needs, but it, they are good programs. I have one question. Um, yes. Can you find out how much it costs? She said that we test twice a week, I guess, for 90 days. Mm -hmm. Can you find out how much that costs? Because if we were to use that as an option of looking for having tests for next year, this would not what we're paying now. Mm-hmm. Yep. So we're going to look at price tag and how, how to get things done to start. Okay. Great. Anybody? Brian, you getting the last word? Well, no, this, like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a soliloquy like Marilyn did, but uh, just you started the meeting by mentioning the, the, the map of the testing that has been done and it's no longer on the site. It uh, is. Yep, it is. Still there? It, yep, on. Okay. I think when I was looking for the grand list, I think I saw it just. So that'll show what areas haven't been tested, basically, as we right. consider. Right. Uh, doing more testing and getting more info as an option, or, or as a not as an only option, but as a as a as a tool in the box. Because yes. I'm guessing the select board isn't going to pick one of these options; it's going to be possibly a mix of options: community septic systems, some conservations. Uh, so if you go like onto the main site, there's a banner, and under services, choose water quality in the maps right there. How many sites are tested along East Lakeshore Drive? Uh, one, two, that three. Are streams. <clears throat> Could you put that on the screen, sir? Um, I can't right now, but um, they're Along East Lakeshore Drive, it goes from Bayside Beach to Crooked Creek, and there the three stream outlets, Crooked Creek, Unnamed Stream, and Smith Creek, which are the three outlets or outfalls that are tested. 
So how many how many testings are we getting that aren't creeks along East Lakeshore Drive? So where the what we're talking about, you know, like where we're looking at is there is there um, sep failing so septics th coming into the lake? This is just specifically for beach closures. Um, and I encourage you guys to go onto the website and look. Um, so but there's, the, along East Lakeshore Drive, there's Crooked Creek, Unnamed Stream, Camp One, and Smith Creek. Okay. And then Bayside Beach, but that's so West Bayside Lakeshore Drive. So Bayside is the one beach, that's the only public beach, and then we're doing the streams. So that's, yep. that's my point. We're, and so, and we know that the, the readings go up from, um, from rain events. Um, so what we're looking to understand is septic overflow, like somebody asked how, what would that look like, how would it change the water thing. So we really need ones in front of the very areas that we're saying are a problem and we're considering spending millions of dollars to um, figure out how to address. So hence, would be good to have some additional data. I got that number. Sarah. Yes, Does sir. the uh, site, the m website, show the exact point where testing is being done? It's a done? map with. Okay. Is it being done up the creek or? At it's the at the mouth. At the mouth. So that would potentially be showing, um, because if we can later on determine that coming down the stream is not the issue, then putting a test right at the edge would be getting any. Um, potentially E. coli coming from the houses right next to the creeks. It would still, I would still say it wouldn't be, a, it's a very important place to test and it's really great that we're testing there. I'm just saying about what we're specifically looking at that would with hit. this, that that wouldn't be as good a place to test as where you're just looking at what's coming from overland from your houses because that's what you guys are talking about. You're talking about human waste E. coli only along East Lakeshore Drive. You're not looking, I, I, I follow your point. And, and that is, if you could prove that there was nothing coming down the creek on that particular event, so you probably need a testing in the creek at the same time as the testing at the mouth, so you can have the same at the same date. But since we're not doing that, we still, it still, it wouldn't be clear. It would, we're, um, given what we've learned over the years about, right, about runoff, and that's not what you guys are looking at. I appreciate all the towns doing in the runoff. Actually, the testing every week is just E. coli. It doesn't identify the source, correct? It doesn't do a correct. DNA test. Right. So correct. We're not knowing whether it's farm runoff That's or, no, but, or whatever, well, so we don't know. But we could still, but it, it, it would, uh, yeah, I think the, the percentage of the samples that even had human E. coli was only, what was it, like 6 or 8% or something, Sarah, of all the samples when they looked at them. It was a very small percentage that had any human E. coli of even all the samples. Well, now that we've veered completely off of land conservation <laughs> and we've gotten into DNA and testing sites, which is not the intent of tonight's meeting, but thank you for the input anyway. Um, any more on land conservation? I, I think questions I've question? heard is you want cost of additional testing. Yeah. Doesn't need to cost. It's what we're spending now. Yep. So we can add that to the um, to the list. Mm -hmm. But this is thank you very much for coming on this beautiful uh, summer night. And you can see how complex this is. And this is just one piece of a very big puzzle. July second, we're talking about rules and regulations. Who from the state's gonna, you know? Um, we're working on that. Okay. And then, as Sarah mentioned, that later in August, as more pieces come together, it'll be the community septic. But again, July 2nd and July 30th is another meeting. Uh, stay tuned for that. But July 2nd, a lot of the rules and regs will come out. And maybe we'll have, our, to have Amy come back and talk about some of the. And our August dates data. are not set yet, but we're looking to do seven. more specific information about what community septic solutions could look like for Colchester. So that we're going to be hot and heavy through the summer. So come back. I just would like to say I appreciate all of you guys going to all of those meetings in such a short summer with that beautiful lake out there. Well, <laughs> <laughs> duly noted. Thank you, Marilyn. <laughs> Thank you. All righty. Oh, and next time, July 2nd, we're at the high school. Cafeteria, and we will have AV and overhead, so we'll have sound and we'll have images, I promise, this time. And bring your friends. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Scott, Brian, Carol, everybody. I mean, this is June 4th. May I have this, um, this is leaking water out of the right. Oh. Would you do me a huge favor because you're taller than I am? Would you turn off the power switch next to it then? Yes. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. It's a problem with running things for the first time of the year. Runoff, right? Oh, geez. Yeah. Um, motion for minutes of June 4th, please. Okay, I make a motion to approve the minutes of June 4th. Second. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Yeah. All good? All good. All those in favor? Thank you. Aye. 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 Very nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks for coming. Thanks for Come back July 2nd for more fun. Did you call the party? <laughs> Septic party. Septic social. Septic social. <laughs> Lemonade and brownies. Visualize. Sorry, I don't know. Um, and just very quickly, um, I know Nick it has a uh, work tonight and was yeah. not going to be here uh -huh. and are they are both um nick and bob excused or i'll, I'll need to decide for the minutes but you don't need to no. yes i guess okay um so the minutes um so I know it's late, guys, but I would like to, um, I think the um, survey was in the packet information portion, right, Sarah? Yes, it was. So I'd love to let you all go, but I'm not going to because I want to talk about, if anybody has thoughts about the um, survey summary that's been so nicely compiled for us by staff. Was it Marty or Sarah? Marty. Thank you, Marty, for pulling that the survey stuff together. It's... Uh... Um, on this thing? Yeah. It's you want to pull it up survey under says. You want the drop box? Yeah, I don't have a pen on me. Oh, yeah. it's here. Sorry. You got distracted over there. Yeah, I thought it was good. <laughs> Didn't hold any punches. <laughs> yeah. No. I was really surprised. I felt like between the disconnect between, I thought the town did a really good job of providing data, lots of data, and um, the, the four things that were, it said was they felt like uh, it, there was a weak role in public discussion and debate. There was a lack of comprehensive and explicit cost benefit. I mean, I thought the town did a great job. These were sort of just the survey takers within the comments that we right, received. But, isn't it, but I mean, we have to like look at this. That's some of the, and the feedback, um, the future, they were concerned about the future of Lakeshore Drive neighborhoods, a lack of understanding about s state wastewater regs, and balancing of fairness, like who's responsible. I mean, we've heard that a lot, that the people, you know, that who are having the failed systems should be responsible. So it, it seems like there was a, like, um, some correlation between, I think, what we're hearing, but it, it's just interesting to me that they felt that the town did a weak role in public discussion. Well, I, they, I don't know what it was. Those were just some of the comments. And again, we didn't no, rank any said, of them. No, we she just said these were the trends. These were the trends that she picked right. up. In the I'm not like finding fault with the town. I'm just interested about the perceptions of mm -hmm. people. You know, I think this came more from the the town vote not what we've done after that. Right. I think it was okay. all kind of responding to how the town presented it right. prior yeah. to the vote. Right. So that's, I took this. Yeah. I, I agree yeah. with Rebecca. I, yeah, I do. That's I totally agree different. Well. I, and I think part of the town does admit that they didn't do a good job. So I'm trying to figure out what they could have done differently, how they could have done it differently. Because I, I think they can got more information out. Uh -huh. uh, and they could have actually responded to some of the other uh, publicity they were getting that wasn't totally true. Yeah. They, they could respond yeah. challenge, to those. Challenge these. Skills. And they chose not to respond. Yeah. And I think that's what a lot of people are kind of responding to, that there wasn't a stance, yeah. a strong stance from the town. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, as far as the 
the cost benefit goes, um, the town kind of picked up the Fire District 2 project and was kind of forced to just shuttle it along. And so a lot of people were like, Jack Scully especially was like, why don't you look at this? And a lot of people rallied behind that and the town didn't really have the time or resources to do what we're doing right now, which is a comprehensive look. And so that was something that people talked about a lot, is why didn't we look at conservation or why didn't we look at community septic? And they just weren't things that the town had the time or space to do. No, I think it's really important yeah. information. I mean, yeah. Again, I thought it was done really well, but a lot of people did, which is interesting. Also, I, I think in um, for Brian and defense of Brian, he was tasked with this and at a very high level. Fire District Two, as you recall, realized that they could not go forward with this project any farther, and the town picked it up. And and. Brian, I think, had a rather compressed time and to, to present what I thought was a lot of really good information, um, whether or not he got the political support or will behind it from, from other parties. And so for my take on these on the analysis that, that Marty put together, the six points, I think one, the uh, town's weak role in public uh, dis discussion and debate, and the last one, the balancing of fairness and responsibility. I see that is more of a critique for the select board to deal with when, it, when we finally pass this over. The ones in between, I think, are ones that we can drill down and be aware of as we do our process and try to be uh, cognizant that, that these are the, the comments that came from the uh, previous effort. And if we can get better um, getting um, doing the cost-benefit analysis, um, clarity, and these other points, hopefully we'll get, uh, we'll get a better result. We'll get closer to get creating a package that um, will work. Is any of the stuff we should add to our matrix? I didn't see anything. Did you, Martin? Um, no, but I think the fact that there is a matrix is probably a huge benefit in terms of the the cost benefit analysis that wasn't done yeah. last time. Having like even just showing the people tonight that there is a matrix and that a lot of options are being considered on a lot of different points is probably a big step up from where we were last year. Yeah, that they only had the one to look at and that mm -hmm. was it. it. It was a binary kind of decision as yeah. opposed to that we are, we're listening and taking in information. So, well, I think number six will remain a challenge, the fairness of it is. funding. It, it's, a, it, it's a huge challenge because it's also your perception of governance and what is good government and what is the public good and, and how do we participate as in a democracy and good government and, and, and infrastructure and, and as Marilyn said, the quality of the water, which we, we all are interested in, but how do we get there from here? But I think one of the things, too, is I, I think you're proposing possible solutions to the select board, but in choosing one of the funding sources or one of the options that is ultimately going to be borne by them versus being too concerned with it yourselves. I think it's very good to be aware of it. Um, and also when you're proposing different funding sources, but um, some of these are bigger challenges ahead. I think you have enough to chew through <laughs> this summer, um, but yeah, those are some good challenges. So just, just to circle back a little bit, and I, I know our audience has left us, but um, I just like to have thoughts on, I'm, I'm concerned about paralysis by analysis, as the saying goes, and, and I, don't knew, I do not know, I think it's a request to the select board if they would authorize. Um, I remember that there was a ceiling on, on the effort that Brian could put forward and on the, for him to work on the, the town ballot option, the sewer option, I think it was, I think it was, well I won't quote it, but there was a, so another year of collecting data and the cost and all that, that's a select board question and that's for them to decide. I don't, how did you all feel about sending that out as another option for another year to, to collect more data? Option. It's not Another option. We'll either. send it up to them. I think okay. like we have the data. That's what I don't understand. I feel like that report has the data in it. So I, I don't know where the disconnect. I mean, you couldn't have come out with the outcome and recommendation they did for sewer without having at least the best data they could. I mean, there's always you know insufficient data when you're making these decisions. But that, that I'm curious as to that. 2013 report. That, that's a huge document. Well, I think part of it's the, the date, 2013. It consider, might be considered dated by some. Maybe. They, so, some folks feel we need more data points, right? Mm -hmm. More exhaustive 
testing, want to drill down on more specificity on where these failures are. And I don't know if we can, that's more of an Amy question perhaps, and I don't know if we can get there from here, and I don't even know if another year would necessarily satisfy that question. We hear the six to eight percent all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's always, it was brought in up every single meeting we've talked about. Yeah. Six to eight percent. Yeah. Why are we spending so much money for six to eight percent without But an again, I, I think you have to realize, and this is where it gets hard to wrap your head around it, is E. coli varies depending on the travel times of the water, the temperature of the water, how dispersed it is within the water. You have wave action and wind, but the fact that it's there to begin with. And I think this was brought up before. How much E. coli, human-born E. coli, is too much? And it was stated, I think, as part of some of the presentations over the winter that any amount is too much. Mm -hmm. um, so again, you could drill down a little bit harder. It would depend on, well, this is more of a wet year than a dry year. Um, we're having a little bit of a cooler spring now, warmer spring. You would have to look at this over a multi-year period if you were going to do it in a scientifically valid way. Um, and again, what different results would you have? It doesn't change the fact that you have a high-risk area for wastewater failures. You have a bunch of things that probably should never have been built <laughs> located in close proximity to the lake with aging systems. Um, the ticking clock. Mm -hmm. It's a risk analysis. Yeah. You can do the risk analysis without collecting additional data and say that, yes, it's a high risk area. And there are different ways of solving it. Um, and the best of an alternatives analysis, you would have data every which way to Sunday, and you'd be dissecting it every which way to Sunday. You'd be yeah. dissecting of, well, should we be looking at a solution for just some of the sewer service area, those most high risk sites, or a portion here or there, combining different factors. Again, your charge was to look at the entirety of the sewer service area and what are the wastewater solutions. It's not going to give you that sort of reiterative analysis of true alternatives analysis is. Um, so, you're starting from a little bit of a disadvantage standpoint because you don't have the time, the funding, or the resources to go back through and do a multi-year study and do that sort of reiterative analysis. Mm -hmm. um, you're doing the best that you can with the data, the time that you have. So I'll recognize that right off the bat and say that it would be great to have more data over more years. You can't get to September. Um, and just deliver to the select board, we need more data. And ultimately, I suppose if they want to punt and go down that route, that's, that's their call. I think it's worthwhile noting yeah. in your findings mm -hmm. the questions that you've raised and the concerns that you have. I think it does seem to be an Achilles heel in terms of um, you know, acknowledging that it's a, high, a ticking time bomb. I like that analogy, Rebecca. That you know, let's let's I get down to the it's, it, it's a ticking time bomb, and <laughs> if you take out all that, all the data and all the other, but it does seem to be the Achilles heel that people keep circling back to some numbers that just it may seem not to stymie today, the, but it could fail tomorrow. No. It could fail five years down the road, but yeah. there's potential. Failure. And each one of them is at high risk. All right, I kept you guys too long. Thank you. Thank you for uh, indulging me. Thank you, Zach, for everything. Best yeah, of luck you, in your yes. travels. Thank you. We'll miss you. Yeah. I guess I need a motion from somebody. We don't have we the have uh, motion man here. <laughs> I'll make a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Rebecca. All right, we'll second. <laughs> Thank you. It's all a favor. Hi. Hi. We are adjourned. No. Thank you. Sorry to keep you so late. Thank you, Mark. Good baptism, so my